throughout the centuries animals such as mules and donkeys and horses and camels to name a few have been used by people to carry a wide variety of things including those people and each one of those animals has the capacity to carry a certain amount of weight and no more than that weight without collapsing under that load. And it was during the mid 18th century that we find an expression that was used to describe that kind of overload, that point of no return, that event which causes animals and which causes people to reach the limit of what they can endure. And that point is called the last straw. Sometimes it's also called the straw that broke the camel's back. Physical, mental, emotional stress or grief or anger that causes us to give way, to react, to explode in one way or another. And in the passage of scripture that is before us today in Acts chapter 22, verses 17 through verse 30, we see some people who had reached their last straw, their point of no return. As we've been looking at this chapter, we have already seen the Apostle Paul in the city of Jerusalem. We have seen him in the Jewish temple. And since it was the Jewish feast of Pentecost, there were thousands upon thousands of Jewish worshipers in that temple. Worshipers from all over the known world. And some of the Jews from the region of Asia Minor were there. And they recognized Paul as the one who had come into their synagogues, in their cities, in their region, and from many of them. They understood that this was the one who drew people away from Judaism and brought them to Christ, proclaiming the good news that Jesus was, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah. And they did not believe. And so these unbelieving Jews saw Paul in the temple in Jerusalem, and when they saw him, a riot broke out, and they began to beat Paul. And they would have killed him, except for the intervention of a contingent of Roman soldiers who descended from the fortress of Antonia, located on the northern end of the temple grounds. And so these soldiers rescued Paul from that mob. They saved his life by carrying him on their shoulders so that the people couldn't tear him. To pieces. And as Paul stood at the top of those stairs, as he was about to go into that fortress for his own protection, he asked if he might say a word, that he might speak to the people. And the commander gave him perm permission. The Lord had orchestrated a unique opportunity for Paul to share his faith in Christ. So in the midst of that hostile situation, that wild mob quieted down. They became silent when they heard Paul begin to speak to them in their own language. And so with his audience, receptive to what he had to say, he began to tell them about himself. 
that he was like them. He was a man with a Jewish background. Judaism was his life. It was his passion. And he believed that it was his sacred duty to violently defend the Jewish religion to the death against anyone who would diminish the value of the customs and of the traditions of the law of Moses, especially to defend it against those followers of Jesus of Nazareth who claimed that he was, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. So, Paul showed no mercy to those followers of Jesus. And as he was on his way to the city of Damascus to arrest more of those followers of Jesus so that he might put them in chains and drag them back to Jerusalem to be punished, as he was approaching the city, he said, something happened to him. Suddenly, he said, I was thrown to the ground. I was thrown to the ground by a blinding light that came from heaven. And as I lay there in the dust, unable to see, I heard a voice, a voice from heaven. And this voice was speaking to me and to me alone. And he identified himself as Jesus, the very one whom I had been persecuting. He was alive. He was no longer dead. And he told me to go into Damascus. And there I would receive further instructions on how I was to serve him. And still blind, I had to be led by the hand into the city. And I arrived there, and three days later, a devout man of God came to me, and I received my sight. And this man told me that I had been chosen by God. I had been chosen by him to be a witness, a witness for him to testify of these things that I had seen and heard, and to testify to the truth that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. He is, in fact, the righteous one, the Christ of God. So, Paul says to that Jewish audience, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, he has done a miracle in my life. He came looking for me. I was not looking for him. He found me. And when he found me, I responded to him. And he saved me. As Paul said in Romans chapter 10, if we will confess with our mouth, and agree with God the Father that he has given all things into the hand of his Son. All judgment has been given into the hands of Jesus Christ. If we will declare that truth from our hearts and submit ourselves to him as our Lord and Savior, if we will believe in our heart that God the Father has raised him up from the dead as proof that our sins have been forgiven and paid for by his death. If we will place our hope and our trust in him, then, then, and only then will we be saved and saved forever we will be delivered from the wrath to come. That is what happened to Paul. And Paul said, after I received my sight, I went into the synagogues in Damascus, and I was boldly declaring the truth of Jesus. And the people there were amazed, as you would expect. 
They were expecting Saul, the persecutor. Now he was really Paul, the follower of Jesus Christ. They couldn't believe that this was the same man. Same man who had come from Jerusalem to arrest the followers of Jesus. So, Paul left the city of Damascus. And where did he go? Well, we know he went into the wilderness. He traveled about 20 miles southeast of Damascus, and he went into the Nabataean Arabia area. And he spent three years there alone with the Lord as the Lord ministered to him, learning, growing, becoming stronger in the things of God. Jesus Christ himself ministered to Paul. And after three years, he returned to Damascus stronger than ever. Why was he stronger? Because he was confident in the truth of the word of God. That is the only thing that gives us strength. That is the only thing that gives us confidence. Confidence in the truth of what the Bible teaches. So we're told in Acts chapter 9, went back into the synagogues in Damascus and proclaimed Jesus. But this time, we're told the Jews plotted together to kill Paul. They wouldn't put up with him any, any longer. It was their last straw. So, at night, some followers of Jesus in Damascus, same ones that he had come to persecute, but who were now his brothers in Christ, they let him down in a basket through a window in the wall of the city, and he escaped. And then what? Then he headed back to Jerusalem. But now... He was a new creation in Christ. He was no longer the same man. He had a new heart. He had a new life. But he also had some new enemies. And as he came into Jerusalem, he had no friends there because the followers of Jesus were still afraid of him. They still thought he was the persecutor. So he was alone with the Lord. Only the Lord was by his side, except for one man, you may recall, a man by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas brought Paul to the apostles in Jerusalem, and he was welcomed. Paul was welcomed into that fellowship there. And so what did he begin to do? Well, he began to do what he had done in the city of Damascus. He began speaking out boldly of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came about, it says in verse 17 of Acts chapter 22, when I returned to Jerusalem after those three years, I was praying. I was praying in the temple. He's not too far from the temple when he's speaking these words, is he? He says, I was seeking the face of the Lord. And it was during that time that I fell into a trance, tells the crowd. I was in a trance, ecstasis in Greek. In my mind, I was transported beyond my normal sense of awareness. I was brought into a supernatural realm of divine revelation. And it was there in my mind that I saw the Lord in all his glory. And not only did I see him, Paul said, I heard him saying, speaking to me. And he said, make haste. Spiudo in Greek. Do not delay. Though you've just arrived in town, you must get out of Jerusalem quickly, it says in verse 18. Tahos, with speed, like right now. 
because the unbelieving Jews whom you are trying to reach with the truth will not accept that truth. Para didomai in Greek, they will not welcome your testimony, your witness about me. And I said to Jesus, Lord, they themselves understand, epistemai, they're well acquainted with my, my former manner of life. The way that I lived before you drew me to yourself, oh, before you dragged me to yourself on that Damascus road. They know that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and to mercilessly beat those who believed in thee. And they also know that when the blood of your servant, your faithful witness, Stephen, was being shed as his body was being crushed in agony and in pain as he was being stoned to death for simply speaking the truth. They know that I was also standing by. I was there. And I was there approving. Soon you the keo in Greek. I was pleased. I was in agreement with their actions. I encouraged them. I condoned the violence. And I was there watching out for their cloaks the cloaks of those who were slaying him. Surely, Lord, surely they will see that I am no longer that man. And so they will receive my words concerning you. They will be amazed at the change that you have made in my life. And so perhaps, perhaps they will receive the truth of the gospel. But as we know, it does not always work that way, does it? Sometimes people just will not believe, no matter what they see in us. And the Lord Jesus said in verse 21, Go, leave this place, for you shall be a witness for me to all men. Therefore, I will send you on an assignment far away from here, even to the Gentiles, it says in verse 21. And the crowd, we're told, listen to what Paul had to say up to this statement concerning the Gentiles. But that was their last straw. That was their breaking point. That was the spark that ignited an explosion in their minds. And then it says they raised their voices and began crying out and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, Iro in Greek, carry him away to death, for he should not be allowed to live a moment longer and pollute this earth with his presence anymore. And as they were crying out, we're told, and shouting, they were throwing their cloaks to the ground and tossing dust into the air in protest and in anger. And so it says in verse 24, the commander of the Roman troops ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks. Things had gotten out of hand, stating that he should be examined, anetadzo in Greek, questioned. How? It says by scourging, using a whip with a wooden handle to which leather straps were attached with chunks of bone and metal in the tips, a torturous ordeal that was sometimes used 
to extract information from prisoners. An ordeal that men frequently died from or were crippled from as the flesh was ripped from their body right down to the bone. A beating we know that Jesus endured before he was crucified. What a savior we have that he endured that pain and went to the cross for us. Well, you know, this was the last straw for this commander. He had had enough. He could think of no other way to resolve this violent situation, so he used violence to try to resolve it so that he might find out and know for sure the reason it says in verse 24, I tia in Greek, the cause of the guilt. He assumed guilt. The cause of the crime. Surely there must be a reason why these people were shouting uncontrollably against Paul that way. And so we're told, when they stretched Paul out with thongs, stretching his hands above his head to a post using leather straps to expose his back to the whip. Then, we're told, Paul said to the centurion, to an officer who was standing by Paul, calmly saying, is it lawful? Access thee? Is it permissible under Roman law for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and who is uncondemned, akatakritos, one who has not had a trial or even been convicted of any crime? And the centurion, when he heard this, he went to his commander and he told him, saying, what are you about to do? You're about to make a fatal mistake. For this man is a Roman citizen. And the commander came and he said to Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Verse 27, Paul simply said this, yes. Yes, and the commander answered, I, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul simply said, but I was actually born as a Roman citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine Paul by scourging immediately let him go. The leather straps that bound him to the post were removed. The chains were removed from Paul. And the commander, we are told, was also afraid. Phobeo in Greek. He was terrified. He was terrified when he found out that Paul was a Roman citizen and he was about to beat him and also because he had put him in chains. Oh, Paul had rescued him. Paul had saved his life because to beat a Roman citizen, to put, even to put him in chains without a hearing, without a conviction, was illegal. And it was a crime that was punishable by death. But at a loss to understand this perplexing situation, the commander decided to take a different approach. So we're told in verse 30, on the next day, wishing to know for certain why Paul had been accused by the Jews, needing to understand exactly what charges they were attempting to bring against him, he released Paul, we're told, and he ordered the chief priests from the nation of Israel and all of the council of their elders to assemble, sun er komai, to come together for a meeting. Maybe they could shed some light on this perplexing situation. And so, we're told, he brought Paul down from the fortress 
and he set him before the council. And sadly, this is the last time recorded in the book of Acts that we see the leaders of the nation of Israel being given an opportunity to evaluate and to embrace the claims of Christ. This would be their last straw. This would be perhaps their last opportunity to come to Christ for salvation because they perhaps now had reached the point of no return with God, with him. You know, there is a last straw for all of us. There is a last opportunity for all of us to come to Christ. And by rejecting him as our Lord and Savior, we reach the breaking point. We condemn ourselves to an eternity of punishment. So why will you die without Christ? Why will you die without him when he offers you life, eternal life, in his presence forever? Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.